Okay, the objective of today's talk is to give an overview of lifestyle medicine, the study design, provide some interim data, and discuss some of the successes and challenges we found along the way. And finally, to talk about what the findings might mean for the treatment of World Trade Center first responders. So a quick disclaimer here, uh, this program is based on the standards and guidelines of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, but the content of this presentation and the study that was funded by NIOSH represents our own work. So one of the goals of today's talk is to make sure that I fully explain what we mean when we talk about lifestyle medicine in this context. The term lifestyle medicine is pretty vague, it's imprecise, it's even a little bit woo-woo, uh, but here we're talking about something very specific, a type of intervention and interaction uh, with patients and I'm hoping by the end of this talk, everyone will uh, come away with an appreciation uh, for the practice of lifestyle medicine. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine is the professional society that advocates for evidence-based, that's very important, education, certification, and research into lifestyle medicine. Uh, they have a peer re reviewed by monthly journal and an annual meeting, which is coming up in October of 2024. Yes, this is a new medical specialty. It's only 20 years old, but it has a very lofty goal, which is to end chronic disease. It is, however, a rapidly growing specialty. This year, a record number of physicians became board certified. Um, there are multiple pathways to board certification for the physician provider, as well as for allied health professionals. Lifestyle medicine, to be very clear, and the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine are not yet members of the American Board of Medical Specialties, although we hope that will change soon. So why do we need lifestyle medicine? Well, I think it's really fair to say that the current system is not working as well as it could or should. Certainly we've gotten much better at treating chronic disease, but it has come at a price. Chronic conditions remain the leading cause of death and disability in this country, and more than 80% of the annual $4 trillion US healthcare bill is spent in some form or fashion on chronic disease. Compared to other advanced economies, adults in America are more likely to have multiple chronic conditions. And in 2020, we saw life expectancy take a big nosedive. Yes, of course, that was due to COVID, due to the opioid epidemic, all that contributed to it. But underlying both those facts is an American population with generally poor mental and physical health. The top four contributors to chronic disease are tobacco and substance use, poor nutrition, and inadequate physical activity. If we define a healthy lifestyle uh, by four qualifications, one is getting enough physical activity, 150 minutes a week, a dietary score in the top 40% on a healthy eating index, having a healthy body fat percentage and not smoking, less than 3% of Americans would qualify as having a healthy lifestyle. Lifestyle medicine is really an effort to formalize a clinical focus on the upstream drivers and root causes of chronic disease. It is a collaborative care model that empowers patients to undertake healthy change and to be responsible for their own health. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine, however, is really careful to make sure to distinguish itself from other similar sounding therapeutic modalities. So I wanna take a minute and just clarify uh, what lifestyle medicine is not. Lifestyle medicine is not complementary and alternative medicine that focuses on treatments that have yet to be uh, well researched. It's not functional medicine, which looks at hormones and detoxification and things like that. There are aspects of mind-body medicine that are included in lifestyle medicine, but per se, it's not the same thing. Integrative medicine is really integrating traditional or conventional medicine with complementary medicine. When it comes to PREV medicine, preventive medicine, we think of that as primarily a population-based specialty looking at large public health programs, although increasingly the American College of Preventive Medicine is trying to build in much more clinical preventive medicine, and that's where lifestyle medicine uh, would fit uh, most neatly. So defining lifestyle medicine, it is the evidence-based, evidence is very important, treatment and or reversal of chronic disease by optimizing what are called the six pillars of health. That is a whole food plant predominant uh, diet, 
getting regular physical activity, having restorative sleep, stress management, avoiding risky substances, having positive social connections, and this last sentence is by far the most important, as the primary therapeutic modality before you get to prescribing pharmaceuticals. So the goal is really, really simple. It is to collaborate with our patients to help them move along the continuum in each of the six pillars of health to restore and optimize their overall health and well-being. So, okay, that sounds great. Uh, let's just tell everybody, hey, everybody, do the six pillars. Let us know how it goes. Just give them the information and, and that it'll all work out. Well, of course not, that doesn't work. Giving people information is not enough. Just telling them what they ought to be doing just leads to resistance in many cases. We need to help them change. Facilitating change is what lifestyle medicine is all about. So let's do a little comparing and contrasting between the traditional approach and the lifestyle medicine approach. In the traditional approach, we're the experts. We got all the answers and solutions. We tell the patient what their health priorities are. We assume everybody's ready to change. And gosh darn it, if they don't change, we focus on, hey, why didn't you do it? In the lifestyle medicine model, we're the coaches. The patient is the expert in their own health. The patient chooses their health goals, strategies, and targets. We're there to offer information on what the patient has told us they need. The practitioner identifies patient readiness to make change and offers strategies to increase their confidence and importance as they make that change. We look for positives and support the patient throughout. In traditional medicine, we focus on the risk factors, those individual risk factors. Patients are positive recipients of our care. In lifestyle mod mod medicine, we focus on the entire patient, their lifestyle, their habits, the context in which they live their lives. The patients have to be active partners in their care. So we all know that asking people to do something they're not interested in doing and they don't have confidence they can achieve is just setting them up for failure. The goal of lifestyle medicine is to uncover where they are ready and confident to make change, no matter how small, doesn't matter how small, and support them in their journey to achieve it. To be a successful lifestyle medicine provider, you have to be a skilled health coach. What's a health coach? Well, a health coach is someone who helps set a patient set and achieve their health goals. It emphasizes uh, their motivation to make change and their readiness to act. We, look, we help them look for any obstacles and then we work with them to find strategies to overcome that. And throughout, we provide encouragement, support, and practical guidance. This is an acquired skill. You can be board certified in it. Health coaching requires proficiency in three behavioral therapeutic modalities, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral techniques, and positive psychology. And I'm gonna spend a minute just running through what each of these practically looks like because this is the heart of the encounter with, with our patients. Okay, motivational interviewing. This is a counseling technique that helps to reveal ambivalence and then resolve ambivalence and use that to enhance motivation for change. So practically speaking, what does that mean? Here's an example. Dr. Welby says to Bob, you know, Bob, on a scale of one to 10, where one is not eating healthy and 10 means eating very healthy, how important is healthy eating to you? Bob says, well, you know, I guess around a five. Bob's ambivalent. He didn't say 10, he didn't say zero. Dr. Welby says, well, it sounds like healthy eating has some importance to you. Why did you choose five and not zero or one? Bob says, well, you know, I, you know, if I eat less junk and more veggies, it's going to help me lose weight and my knees might hurt less. Bob has just delivered you a gold nugget. He's told you his motivation for change. Dr. Welby says, okay, so what I heard you say is eating more veggies would help you lose weight and reduce knee pain. That's a great reason. How might you add more veggies to your diet? And Bob says, well, I was thinking about trying some new recipes that include more vegetables. He's now talking about action. So we've moved Bob from ambivalence to motivation to action. In my humble opinion, one of the most important questions you may ever ask a patient is, why not zero? 
because there in that question, you will find a reason why they want to make change. That's their motivation. That's what we want to build on. Okay, the next therapeutic modality is cognitive behavioral therapy. This is helping patients uh, identify unhelpful thought patterns and behaviors and strategies to overcome them. It's really giving them tools to sort of recognize their negative thinking, interrogate it, and um, help them unblock whatever's blocking them. So here's an example. Betty says, you know, walking helps me lose weight, but I can't walk when it's too hot, it's too cold, it's raining when I'm tired, when my husband can't come. This is a great example of what we call all or nothing negative self-talk. So Dr. Welby says, okay, I understand uh, those challenges. I get that. But how do you feel afterwards, after you've walked? What we're doing is we are recalling her motivation. Betty says, oh, I feel great after I walk. And Dr. Welby says, okay, well, what are some other possibilities that might help you keep up your walking routine? We're challenging her blocking thoughts. And she says, well, I guess I could go to the mall when the weather's bad or my husband can't come, but I'm not really sure. And this is a great, a great comeback. What's the worst that could happen if you tried it a few times? So you've challenged it, you've got Betty thinking, and this is how we do cognitive behavioral therapy. The next thing we need is positive psychology. For the lifestyle medicine encounter, the goal is to focus on the wins, not the losses. This is the art of positive psychology. If a patient is able to achieve just a tiny fraction of whatever goal they set, whether it's walking one day a week instead of four, we focus on that one day. That's great. You got that walk in. We don't ignore the negative. We review that, what happened, how much you do things differently next time. Um, you, don't, you don't focus on the, the, the negative overall. What you really want to emphasize is they achieve part of their goal and you remain optimistic that they're going to get them next time. In other words, you want to Ted Lasso the patient. So motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral techniques, and positive psychology are super powerful therapeutic modalities. But to be a good health coach, the person we need to start with is the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, the doctor in the mirror, however you want to say it. And we have to change our own mindset. And we have to overcome what is called the writing reflex, which is the tendency for trained providers to just sort of reflexively tell patients what to do. You ought to lose weight, document in the chart. This is actually um, can be counterproductive. Some patients, you know, advising patients to make change is a really good thing. But sometimes it's counterproductive. It can disempower them. It can reduce uh, them seeking motivation for change because the whole time we're telling them that they're thinking to themselves, gosh, dude, tell me something I don't know. Oof, I've tried that a hundred times. It's not that helpful. Uh, we really want to work with our patients, resist that writing reflex so that we support them in their efforts to find their own motivations and their own solutions. We want to dance with our patients. We don't want to wrestle. I'm making this point um, because this is a really high level skill and it, mastering it takes training, time, practice. But as you get better and better at it, I can tell you it is the most fun you will ever have in working with patients. Okay, so now the study, I'm not gonna repeat the whole long name. Uh, we call it the LMG program for short. Uh, Dr. Garland is our master at coming up with the right uh, little uh, logos that we can use and she came up with that. This is an R21. The dates of the grant were July 2022 through July 2024. Why did we choose GERD? Unsurprisingly, uh, it's super unpopular. Nobody likes it. Uh, it reduces quality of life. Patients are complaining about uh, potential PPI side effects, which of course they hear about on the news. Really common in the World Trade Center first responder population. It's pricey. We write thousands and thousands and thousands of acid reduction prescriptions every year. This, these numbers are a little bit out of date. I don't expect them to be much different. And GERD also happens to be rapidly responsive, or we figured it would be rapidly responsive to lifestyle modifications. So that's why um, we picked that. Our hypothesis was that participants in the program would experience a reduction in symptoms and or medication use associated with GERD and report satisfaction with uh, the intervention. I wanna be clear, patients could choose to either reduce symptoms or reduce medication use or both. So they had a choice. 
specific aim number one was to pilot the program to reduce symptoms and medication use in eligible and interested patients and delivered via telemedicine. Number two, to assess feasibility of incorporating health data tracking technology, texts and stuff like that, to assess and track symptoms and medication use in the participants, and to evaluate participant behavior change as well as satisfaction with the telemedicine intervention. Our goals were to enroll 75 patients who would complete all surveys, attend all visits. The initial visit was the big visit, 60 minutes, sometimes even more than that, and a monthly 30 minute visit, and then a final 60 minute to review where they were at and how the study worked for them for a total of seven visits over six months. Our um, program outcomes were symptoms and medication use over the study period, six month study period, as well as patient satisfaction and perceived value of the intervention. Inclusion criteria was you had to have GERD certification, you had to have heartburn, and you had to demonstrate previous or partial response to acid reduction therapy. Now, for those patients who had one of the conditions in group B, and I'm not gonna go over, go over this, it'll take up too much time, um, we actually worked with our GI advisors, who I will uh, tell you who they were, uh, and, and they worked with us to decide who would be not suitable for the study, to, in other words, to get the full intervention. And they were um, given the full initial uh, session, and then we will follow them up at the end of the study. Very few patients were excluded because of a group B um, indication. So the study flow from participant engagement to evaluation, uh, we worked really hard to recruit. We socialized the heck out of the program during provider huddles and everywhere. Uh, we asked all the providers multiple times to send us their referrals. Uh, we put up posters in the clinic. We sent invites via texts, phone calls, and letters. Once a person um, expressed interest, they were contacted by one of our wonderful, amazing service management coordinators, either Sahara Curtis, or Alicia Green, if they, uh, they were sent a packet of information, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then it, once they decided they wanted to be in the program, they were just consented and scheduled for the first uh, visit and all the subsequent visits. We provided the intervention, talked about that. And then about a week um, after they completed the program, they got another survey, which was a program evaluation and satisfaction survey. So enrollment has uh, closed and we are in the follow-up visit phase as well as assessing feasibility and patient satisfaction. Okay, lifestyle medicine, just like traditional medicine has its own vital signs. They're not your granny's vital signs. Nothing wrong with blood pressure, nothing wrong with uh, cholesterol and all that other stuff. Uh, but in lifestyle medicine, our vital signs are related to measuring how well they're doing in terms of having whole food in their diet, moving well, sleeping well, uh, having good mental health, uh, and so on. And we use that data to track their progress in the program. So the American College of Lifestyle Medicine promulgates um, a variety of surveys. Uh, some of them include validated surveys and some are not validated. Uh, but these, these are all free. You can find them on their website. There's short versions and long versions. Um, and we actually took those um, created by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and uh, came up with our own bespoke branded surveys um, uh, to, build, to build these out that included, of course, all assessments of all the six pillars, as well as the short version of the PAR-Q uh, to screen for fitness for exercise. For increased exercise. Uh, in terms of the uh, nutritional assessment, we use the 12 question four leaf survey, which gives an estimate of percent whole plant based foods uh, that the participants are consuming. Zero leaf is the lowest, four leaves is the highest. And in the getting started section of the survey, uh, participants ranked each of the pillars in terms of importance to them and their confidence in making change. Okay. We also included, uh, in addition to the vital signs, we assessed them uh, with a GERD survey. And this is the Health Related Quality of Life GERD survey. Uh, there are 16 questions, some relate to reflux, some relate to heartburn, but importantly, I just wanna call this last question out. We asked them how satisfied they were with their present uh, condition. All this, and we also did a, a thorough medication assessment. Now all this, 
material, as well as the program informationals, which were really colorful and really pretty, was mailed to the patient. So they could look it over once they expressed interest and uh, then decide if they wanted to participate. But when it came to data capture, we didn't have them fill out paper surveys. We used a texting platform and our IT partner uh, was Q Reviews, which is the patient satisfaction tech platform that is used here at Mount Sinai. And they created a uh, version of the surveys that could be sent via text for the vital signs, the symptoms, as well as the satisfaction. Um, and the patients did it on their cell phone. Let me tell you, it's bing, 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 bing. It takes, if it takes a minute 30 to fill out the, uh, the um, symptom questionnaire and the medic medicine questionnaire, super easy to do. All that data all wound up in the dashboard, this wonderful dashboard that Q Reviews created for us. I blanked out the patient's names. And then we could see the answers to all their responses on the variety of surveys. And then we would take this information and pre-chart it into our Epic notes before each visit. So when, we, when the patient came, we, we knew where they were at. The LMG program was delivered entire, entirely via telehealth. There were no in-person visits. All encounters were either virtual, real-time audio only, or video via Epic MyChart or Doximity. And participants had to be in a state where the provider is licensed. For me, that is New York and Florida. Okay. Uh, the LMG program intervention was delivered by myself, as well as Dr. Claudine Holt. We are both board certified in uh, lifestyle medicine, but Claudine has something I don't which is a brand new book she just came out with called How Healers Heal. Uh, this is Reflections of Lifestyle Medicine Providers Around the Country. She's a co-author and it's available on Amazon. Uh, she's not giving me a kickback, but I'm, I'm really happy for her. So I'm giving her a shout out there. Okay, so let's, let's talk about what this looks like. This is not a real patient. This is Bob. He's an amalgam of all of our patients. You will recognize him. This is just a sample. So Bob is a 54-year-old retired NYPD. He's working the security a little bit. He heard about the whole PPI thing. He's concerned about that. He heard about the program, wants to give it a try. He was consented, scheduled, met all inclusion criteria, and now we're in the first visit with Bob. Obviously, we do a GERD-focused history, looking at past medical history in general, past surgical history in general, but we tend to focus on past GERD treatments, triggers, and behavioral changes and how he responded to those. We do a full medication list review, but we look particularly for medications that might be amping up um, GERD. And I put a little asterisk here. If anybody's curious about what we're seeing with the GLPs, we can talk about that later. We look at all GI notes, we review any procedures that have been done, testing, so on and so forth. Patients self-reported their weight and we ask them to measure their waist circumference. Okay, so Bob filled out his vital signs survey and we learned the following about Bob. He's getting less than 30 minutes a week of moderate activity. He's not doing any resistance training. He got a zero leaf on the um, four leaves to survey, not unusual. He sleeps less than five hours a night. He has sleep apnea, he snores, hates CPAP, not going back to sleep then. Several times a month, his reflux wakes him up and this is a big uh, problem for him. His total GERD score was 28. He's not satisfied with that. His triggers are coffee, pizza, beer. Um, he was very isolated during the pandemic as were so many uh, people. And he's on a Miprazole 40 daily and his self-reported weight is 220 pounds. Now, of course, this is a medical visit. If we find anything concerning, we absolutely refer everybody along. Uh, the one thing I wanna point out here is that there, if they did uh, screen positive on the part two, we would send them to their primary or cardiologist to get clearance. Next, we review with Bob what we call our GERD checklist of lifestyle modifications. These are all the things that Bob can do sort of mechanically and practically and logistically that can uh, have been shown to reduce reflux. I won't go into all of these, but it's things like remaining upright after meals, you know, waiting before you go to sleep, so on and so forth. And so we go over that with Bob. So after we've looked at all these things, the vital signs, the GERD checklist, we look at where Bob is and we compare it to what the recommendations are. And we discuss with Bob what those gaps are. What are some of the risks of not changing? What might be some of the benefits of changing? So we know that Bob only got 30 minutes of physical activity. So we said, well, you know, the recommendations are 150. We talked that through. He only sleeps five, 
five hours a night, he should be getting seven. He got zero leaves, he should be getting four or three. We talk about some isolation and how a social connection is so important. So the next thing we wanna do before we come deep into sort of goal setting is we want to understand Bob's whole story as much as we can. We wanna understand the challenges that he might be facing, what support systems he has that he can lean on as he works to make change. We learn the following. His wife cooks and caters to his taste, which is mostly meat and potatoes. He likes fruits and veggies, just doesn't eat them. Dinner is the largest meal of the day, usually around seven. Then they lay down, watch TV for a couple hours before they go to bed. His wife is very concerned about his weight, not his case about it. Uh, he has some social you know, stressors. His mom is sick. There's financial issues around that with his siblings. Again, isolated during the pandemic and hasn't really connected with friends. Super proud of his son who just joined NYPD last year. And we learned that he was a successful um, high school football player. And that can be quite useful as we coach him to make change. His wife and son are very supportive, very supportive of him making change. Next, we put on our coaching hat. Here's, here's where the fun stuff starts. And we ask, you know, let's talk about what you think you could do. We use all of our, our uh, uh, talk techniques, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral, positive psychology, as we talk to Bob. And we learn the following. You know what? He's really been thinking about doing more physical activity. He does want to increase fruits and veggies, but he's not giving up the that three cups of coffee or the Coca-Cola. He'll try a wedge pillow that we discussed might help with his snoring and nighttime reflux. He's willing to make changes to both his mealtime and bedtime. His weight, he does not think he needs to lose weight. He thinks he looks great. That's his wife's issue. And he does want to connect with old friends and that's on his mind. <clears throat> Next, what we do is we ask Bob to pick his three top goals that he feels both confident and that he rates as high importance to him. And he has to rate those at least a seven out of 10 before we move forward in goal setting. And they are physical activity, foods and veggies, and concrete stuffs to, re, uh, to reduce reflux. We review all the challenges. We discuss exactly how the patient might tap into his or her support network. Sometimes you can even map this out. You want to ride to the farmer's market. Who are you going to call? You're going to call your friend. Um, often we look up community resources. So when patients are talking about increasing walking, we'll go, we'll look at like what the local parks are in Staten Island or where they might go so they can be outdoors at the same time. And we identify any of those community resources quite specifically. After this conversation, we negotiate, we talk, we, we go through it and we come up with the SMART action plan. The SMART action plan is specific, it's measurable. Bob can do it, he can achieve it. It's important to him, it's relevant and it's timed. And Bob commits to, he says, I will walk at a pace during which I can still talk but not sing for 30 minutes in the, e the evening after dinner with my wife on Tuesday and Thursday nights and Saturday afternoon for the next 30 days. That's how specific we make these commitments. We talk about support network, his wife, what are some barriers to getting this done? And he might feel tired, but he's gonna remind himself, it's gonna give him energy. And we do this for each of his top uh, goals. Very specifically, he's gonna have broccoli once a week, gonna have salads twice a week, and an apple twice, twice a week. Talk about his, in, his obstacles and how he's gonna work through that. For number three, he's gonna remain upright for at least two hours after the evening meal and wait three hours before going to bed every night for the next 30 days. And he's gonna uh, try a wedge pillow. NIOSH doesn't cover this anymore, FYI, so they're having to buy it on their own. Um, and he, we talk about his obstacles. Those smart action plans become a lifestyle medicine prescription. We call this non-pharmacologic prescribing. Bob virtually commits to the goals that he has set down. I write down exactly what the goal is, just as I showed you in the SMART action plan, that becomes the prescription. I send it to Bob via my chart. He acknowledges that he's received it. That's my prescription. In addition to um, that, 
I would attach any of the, uh, to that my chart message with the prescription, a variety of educational materials from our library that relate specifically to Bob's goals. So it has to be relevant to him. I just don't flood them with any old thing. Um, and this is all created by credible sources, ACLM, CDC, Forks Over Knives, Full Plate Living, so on and so forth. Okay, so Bob is out there, he's doing his goals. It's a month later. He gets a little text before our meeting um, and he fills it out, uh, the GERD survey. I noticed before our meeting that his GERD scores actually dropped from 28 to 20. He's still on omeprazole 40. Uh, and we meet Bob and I said, what's going on? How's it going? And he says, you know, I was really successful uh, with that walking. That, that was really great. I only missed three days and that was because of bad weather. That's great, that's amazing. Um, his wife actually got into the whole vegetable thing and he says it's much easier than he thought to bring in some more healthy food into his diet. Now the wife has got a hold of it and she's gonna increase it even further. He tried the wedge pillow, didn't love it, but perhaps the earlier eating and um, remaining upright has helped him because he has not had any nighttime reflux over the past month. So we're gonna talk this through. What's he gonna continue with? Does he wanna build on this? And he says, yes, he'd like to add uh, some resistance training. We write a SMART goal, becomes a prescription, and you see how it flows from there uh, for the next uh, six visits. Okay, so that's a little snapshot of what an intervention looks like. Let's look at where we are on our study. Uh, enrollment began in January and concluded in November of 2023. 53 participants had at least one visit. 18 participants completed all seven visits. Uh, 17 are still active with uh, anticipated completion in June. And 14 participants completed the evaluation and satisfaction survey. There's some participants floating around out there uh, that we can talk about in the chat. Okay, so what are we seeing so far? Uh, the following data is all interim. This is not the end of the story, uh, uh, but some things are jumping out. So in terms of demographics, we can take a look at that. If you look at the group uh, that completed at least one visit, that's a large group, that's an N of 53. Mean age is about 60. No big difference between for the N of um, uh, 18 in the completers, those that had at least six visits. Same, same difference. But what's really interesting is that women were a tiny percentage of the people who, well, 23% of the group that expressed interest and completed one visit. But if you look at the completers, that's 40%. I think you can draw your own conclusions about, about that. Okay, if we look at how uh, the initial group, again, those that completed the first visit, and a 53, uh, how they felt about their condition, the majority were either dissatisfied or neutral. I'm just putting this out there, I don't have uh, firm data on this, but I'm guessing this neutral group is people who are um, controlled on a medication, but don't wanna be on it. And that's, that's a lot of people. A little bit about the GERD score. I said you can break it down into heartburn versus regurg. We're not gonna go through all that here. It's, it's not the main story. So we're just gonna focus on the total GERD score. Keep in mind the highest GERD score is 75. So if we look at the initial mean total GERD score of the group that completed one visit, that's 53, was 26.6 with a standard deviation of 13.8. If we look at that, the initial versus the final mean total GERD score in the completers, that is those who had six or more visits, the initial mean uh, total GERD score was 24. The final mean total GERD score was 11.9 with a difference of 12.1 and a p-value of 0 0.009. Graphically, that looks like this. This is mean total GERD score in visit by completers, and it's pretty easy to see um, how this went. In uh, the N of 18 who completed uh, at least six visits. Now, if we look at initial PRN, PRN as needed, so they're having a little breakthrough going on. Uh, GERD medication used over month, over the past month by class, you can see it's all over the map, but 
at least about, you know, almost 70% are taking as needed uh, PPIs along with any of these other uh, medications out there. So there's a lot of breakthrough going on. If we look at pre and post PRN GERD medication use number of times per week in the completers, we see the following. At the beginning of the study, the majority of participants were taking a PRN medication five plus times. That's five times a week. That's significant. By the end of the study, the majority had reduced to either one to four times per week of a PRN medication or none at all. This has a p value of 0.01. This is pre and post PRN GERD medication use number of times per week in individual completers. It's just, um, just to see visually how, how it really uh, went down uh, from people um, having very high use to, to uh, getting off the meds. If we look at pre and post, satisfied with your present condition in completers, those completing at least six visits and then at 18, you can see that at the start of the study before, that's the blue line, they were dissatisfied or neutral. By the end of the study, this had shifted towards more being neutral or satisfied. Not gonna read through all the specific games again, just to say that the pilot was successfully implemented. We successfully assessed feasibility of health tech integration into clinical care to track symptoms and medication use and we were able to set successfully evaluate behavior change and satisfaction with the telemedicine program. Our study outcomes. First, symptoms and medication use over the six month study period, we found significant improvement in GERD symptoms, significant positive change in satisfaction with present, con present condition, and significant reduction in PRN GERD medication use. For the second study outcome, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Maya Corin, and um, she's gonna take us through patient satisfaction and perceived value, so. Great, thank you, Dr. Hi, Simone. hi, okay, great, ready to go. Um, okay, uh, thank you, everyone. I'm going to make this quick because quite frankly, things were great. So not much to talk about other than how much the participants loved it. Uh, next slide. So we used a couple of measures um, that were pretty standardized and well validated to uh, see whether the participants um, accepted the, uh, you know, thought that the program was acceptable, feasible, um, and whether they actually liked it. Um, so first, we kind of had a five point Likert scale of whether uh, participants found it to be acceptable, right? So did they like it? Did they welcome it? We ask questions like that. This is on a scale from one to five. And as you could see, <laughs> things ranged from, you know, averages ranged from 4.8 to 4.92. I mean, they loved it. Um, they really, really thought that it was acceptable. Um, we didn't have anyone answer below a four on a five point Likert scale, which I think is pretty incredible. Uh, next slide. And they also thought it was rather appropriate. Um, so these were questions around whether they thought that the intervention was fitting, suitable, applicable, and a good match for them. Um, and again, we didn't have any um, participants rate any of these questions below a four. Um, and the average score was a 4.86. Something that's really important to do when you're doing any sort of intervention is whether participants at the end of the day think that this is something that's doable for them, right? Can they feel like they could do this again with this work beyond their, you know, themselves? Do they think that this was something that was easy enough to do, right? Because if it's something that's really difficult to implement, they're not going to feel like this is something that long-term would work. Um, and here again, nobody scored below a four on a five-point Likert scale. Um, they really thought that it was implementable, doable, possible, and very easy to use. And I think a much of that is also uh, speaks to the strength of our providers um, and the ease of use in incorporating the technology as well, right? So because um, these visits were through telemedicine, right? It, I think 
people were much more likely to actually attend these visits. Um, they were longer, they actually got personalized attention, which I think is something that very rarely happens um, with a provider. Uh, and the use of technology really aided in that, right? They didn't have to leave their house. They could answer all these surveys on their phone. Um, it was really, really easy to use. Uh, and the numbers show it as well. Uh, next slide. And lastly, were they satisfied with the intervention? We had a whole bunch of questions. I really only picked out a couple of them. Um, but, you know, again, nobody scored. These were all on a, on a Likert scale of, of four points. Nobody scored anything. Nobody disagreed or completely disagreed with any of these statements, um, which, I, again, is all positive feedback. Um, they felt that it met their needs. 100% of people responding, so, okay, it was 14, but still, uh, everyone said that they would recommend it to a friend, which I think is really incredible that they liked it so much that they would tell other people to, to do this as well. Um, and again, everyone either agreed or completely agreed with the statement that it helped them deal with their GERD more effectively. It's, you know, I think the program really, the numbers speak for themselves, but it's really very wonderful to see that this kind of intervention not only works, right? So it's not only effective at lowering GERD score, which of course is uh, much of what we're trying to do, but they actually liked it. Um, and so it didn't just work, but they enjoyed it, which is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Um, okay, I'll talk about some of the limitations or is it, should I, I'll do that and then we'll do Q and A. We obviously, we had trouble recruiting the full 75, the site, uh, despite some pretty aggressive outreach, we're continuing to uh, work to increase retention. Um, six months is not an adequate time to really fully initiate medication taper and to see that it works and they're stable on it. It's also not an adequate time frame to, um, to assess durability of the, of the intervention effect. In other words, we don't know uh, if, this, if this was a lasting um, benefit to them. Although I will say that I have talked to patients who are still um, experiencing less reflux for whatever that's worth. The technology platform, they, the Q reviews is great. This is no, no complaint about Q reviews, but it doesn't interface with our EMR. It doesn't interface with Epic. There's, therefore, what we have to do, Dr. Holt and I had to do was take all that information on the dashboard and transcribe it into an Epic note when we pre-charted so that everything was ready when the patient came. That can take, that took me about 30 minutes. Uh, so that's, that's not ideal. Um, and uh, the, the tech platform has no analysis capability, so it can't calculate the bird score, can't calculate the four leaf. So the, all that had to be done separately, all that information gathered and then transcribed to the um, note, into uh, the note before the um, visit. Okay, just some observations. This is an exhaustive the majority of the participants were really able to easily access and use the texting platform as well as my chart and proximity virtual visits. Everybody is trained in this now, okay? There's almost nobody who can't do this because of the pandemic. If somebody did have a problem, Sahara or Alicia got on the phone with them and talked them through it. The feedback that we're getting from the providers where the patients have returned uh, to their own, you know, treatment provider is uniformly positive. And some of it is amazing, like change my life, da 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 amazing. Uh, patients were really engaged and very appreciative, mostly that the program was being offered. And some would say, why isn't everybody doing this? Um, and I'll uh, tease this out uh, because there's a lot of data that's going to need to be analyzed when all is said and done. Self-reported weight aligned with clinic measurements. So in other words, if the patient told me they weighed 220 pounds, I'd go back to the note and say, well, last time they were here, how much did they weigh? And it was pretty close. And then I would, if they say, if weight loss was one of their goals and they self-reported weight loss, and I would see when the last time they came in and those things aligned and some lost significant amounts of weight. Um, that's a separate matter. That wasn't part of our study, uh, but we, we saw some major health gains, weight loss, we call weight loss health gain. Um, in terms of impacts on the treatment, uh, uh, on what this might mean for the first responders, this is a valuable addition to GERD treatment modalities. Mind if we don't say, but we think all patients should be offered a lifestyle medicine program. 
uh, all GERD patients in the program. We think it should be much more fully explore, explored for other World Trade Center for certified conditions, and maybe just for overall health. Um, this is a major opportunity to re-engage and retain uh, uh, our first responder population. Now I want to talk about dissemination. Um, we had the luck to have the world's expert on reflux disease, Dr. Michael Smith, here at Mount Sinai. And he agreed to assist us with this program. He committed a lot of his time to guiding us, to looking at cases, to analyzing and designing um, the program. And him and Dr. Grinspan, our other providers, were deeply involved. I cannot thank them enough. He actually took some preliminary data out to Vancouver, where he presented at the American College of Gastroenterology, uh, some of our preliminary stuff. He is on the call today, and we should uh, get him engaged in this as soon as I'm done with this little thing. I took a poster out to Denver for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine meeting. Um, going forward, we have submitted a poster to ACPM. We're waiting to hear our back on that. We're going to be submitting additional, um, we hope to be doing presentations and I mean, conferences. We have a process publication describing the program. We're working on that now. And once all data is, is uh, com the studies completed and data is analyzed, our intention is uh, to work with uh, Dr. Smith to and Dr. Grinspan to submit to a high impact GI journal. Future innovations. These are just suggestions. Um, we think World Trade Center of First Responders should be offered an opportunity to participate in lifestyle interventions for the indication of their choice, not necessarily for what they're certified for. Uh, we do think that group visits should be offered so that we can build out the educational offerings that we have around lifestyle medicine. We don't have a nutritionist or uh, you know, somebody who does um, you know, sports type medicine on, on tap here. And building that out a little bit might be really helpful. We want to keep building out our library of resources for patient education. We want to expand our referrals to, to build out a full lifestyle medicine um, offering, which is when you go to a lifestyle medicine practice, a lot of these people are on site. They have nutrition, they have cooking, they have physical activity, they have stress management. Um, and we need to build uh, a workforce through training and certification that can offer and deliver this type of intervention. Okay, just to shout out everybody, Dr. Meyer is uh, amazing. He has helped us throughout. We could not have completed this whole thing without Liz Garland, who has by far the most experience in getting these studies up and running. Uh, couldn't have done it without her. Dr. Korn could not have done it without her helping us on evaluation. And again, shout out to Michael Smith, Ari Grinspan, Dr. Holt, myself, absolutely the staff was amazing. Sahara, Alicia, and then managers, Michelle Bonilla and Melena Kotcher, who helped us so much get the program out there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sine and Dr. Korn for your uh, informative presentation. I